up Knowledge to Act, Challenging Inequalities as part of the cross-cultural program. Today, uh, we are having our last panel together already, uh, but before we get started on, on our topic of the day, I would just like to remind uh, our two good news is our, our announcements. So the new call for this fellowship will be up and open in November on the IFA website. And the publication Knowledge to Act is also finally out and will shortly be uploaded to our website. So don't miss them out and, and check our website whenever you get a chance. All right, so the last two days we've been talking about major thematics that are at the same time underlying consequences of inequalities, but also underlying causes of inequalities, um, discrimination, radicalization, and, and gender empowerment. Today we felt we're going to move away from thematics to try to dive into practices. What can we do facing these thematics or many others that affect inequalities? And so for us to do this, we, we chose the topic of social entrepreneurship as a tool that has been flourishing in the past 20 years across borders, across the globe, to try to found not only practical solutions to real issues, and but also allow economic empowerment and allow financial sustainability for a variety of organizations. So to join me in, in this discussion are two wonderful speakers who both have the experience on the ground, but have also had the chance to, to strongly reflect and learn about the different practices in social entrepreneurship. So we have from Lebanon, uh, Ziad Hadara, who works with various UN agencies and international uh, organizations. He is also the founder of My Middle East, a socially responsible travel business and is a, a fellow colleague on uh, the NACI executive board. Also with us today from Georgia, we have Margot Japarizzi, who has eight years in experience in NGOs in the field of citizenship education and diversity issues in South Caucasus and Europe. She is a co-founder of the social enterprise Community House Neighborhood Multifunctional Center. Margot will get us a deep dive into her experiences in setting up this kind of social enterprises and working uh, with minorities in Georgia. So without further ado, Margot, we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Nelly. And first of all, thanks for organizers for inviting me. Uh, so as uh, as been presented, I'm Margot from Georgia uh, and uh, I'm co-founder of Social Enterprise um, the neighborhood, and I will try in uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, to be as practical as possible and to tell you um, if you are considering um, uh, social enterprise to be a solution, for example, social issues that you, you want to solve in your community, uh, then could, this might be a helpful and I will be very happy to answer to any of your questions. And uh, I will share my screen to uh, to present. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's called uh, Neighborhood, um, uh, the social enterprise itself. And um, uh, uh, we are a, a team uh, of uh, nine co founders. Actually, uh, it's even uh, very, uh, how to say, it's very. Um, uh, unofficial that we are co-founders because actually it belongs to the NGO. So co-founders are just the ones who are uh, taking part in the uh, decision. But the uh, house itself, the, the let's say social enterprise belongs to the NGO. Uh, so it has also an independent structure. The social enterprise which has a director, manager, accountant, local manager. So the NGO Iris Group, which is an organization which I have been presenting for a long time, I worked in for uh, for the, in the in the organization in uh, for like eight years, uh, which is based in Tbilisi, and we are working on diversity issues uh, all around Georgia and also in the South Caucasus and outside of Georgia, uh, and mostly we are doing educational activities for young people about diversity issues and civic activism. Um, uh, our mission. 
for the social enterprise uh, was that we wanted uh, the space uh, which was adopted to our needs, uh, the space which would make uh, affordable uh, in case we don't have a budget, because we are a small organization, we liked what we were doing, but we uh, we were not sure that um, we were not unsure because we always had to struggle, for example, different kinds of donors. But most of the money was going for exactly for hotels and the space that we were that we were occupying. Uh, and uh, just to reduce the cost, we knew that we need something that is uh, exactly for us. And even if we don't have budget, we can organize by, our, by ourselves. Uh, so that is why we decided that we want to create this kind of space. We bought the house uh, as a co-owners together. Um, and uh, as our mission, we said that not only to serve ourselves, but also to, to provide budget-friendly space for other organizations and the, um, uh, civil uh, activists uh, and um, uh, such kind of groups. Um, also, we wanted to re revitalize the region to go somewhere that no one else um, uh, no one else goes, let's say, because this is not touristic area, etc. But that that has a potential. Uh, so we chose this kind of place, a uh, rural place, and also we wanted, of course, uh, to help the rural community because the house uh, itself, uh, want, we wanted to, to be as like a community house uh, and support uh, local people in education and employability. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the, exactly the space, how it looks like. This is, let's say, a training space. So uh, the house itself is partly renovated, let's say. We are still in the process of getting funds, crowdfunding and so on. Every, um, every year, every month could be the place, the, the time when we are uh, doing such kind of activities. So it's endless uh, process. Uh, this is an, so training uh, space uh, where people get together. Um, this is, for example, the yard where also local community kids, for example, are um, having a cartoon evening, let's say. Uh, we have um, uh, let, uh, dorms uh, where people can sleep uh, because of the COVID. Now we are not using like bunk beds, uh, but uh, yeah, we can accommodate less people uh, because of uh, these issues. The yard also you can see here, and actually what we are, uh, what is our offer or the product uh, that we are proposing to community outside of us, outside of the social mission, is that we have. Uh, um, overnight stay, like we have a, a 25 bunk beds, so we can accommodate, accommodate 25 people. We can rent out the conference room, uh, we can provide restaurant service, we have garden, for example, those who want to stay with, um, for the camping, for example, uh, and we also provide local services, local uh, extra services, like, um, for example, local tours, um, dinner or wine tasting with a neighbor, etc. Uh, because this is uh, quite popular, um, generally the region where we, where we are located, Kaheti, is quite popular for uh, for the wine uh, wine tourism. Uh, I marked it in, um, in pink because these two services are actually quite limited, uh, uh, taking into consideration uh, current issues of um, uh, COVID and also uh, uh, like issues of uh, having ability, for example, to also provide restaurant restaurant service. Kitchen is uh, like need a lot of money also to um, to get the funding for that. So uh, we are kind of uh, also doing um, restaurant service with our neighbors. So people come to our place, they can stay for a night, have a uh, breakfast, but for the lunch and dinner, then we go to the neighbor and we have a, a dinner uh, uh, in the house of our neighbors. Uh, yeah, uh, so since um, uh, the neighborhood uh, had been found, this like we started in 2018 and from 2020 this year in summer, we started already hosting at the activities. Uh, of course, we employ the local people. So um, we have uh, around uh, 100 people uh, that have been um, uh, helping to us, uh, the drivers, cook, uh, gardener, renovation works, etc. Also, we have temporary staff, uh, our um, the local manager. And we are taking already bookings uh, since June 2020. This is not like you cannot find it on Hostel World and so on, because we are also specifically as, as our mission, for example, we are working for uh, the organizations, uh, especially and the ones who are working the, on the issues um, uh, uh, related to civil society, diversity, etc. Just supporting the also other NGOs. So that is why it's not like we are not going online yet, because also we don't feel like we are ready for uh, this kind of like you no know, secondary or third uh, type of um, um, 
benefit, uh, target group, but uh, we are now working with uh, mostly with NGOs. Uh, so what is uh, our um, income? Uh, as I told, uh, basically it's the service that we are uh, selling. But before we started the service, of course, this was a lot about uh, uh, about grant applications, making like uh, having grants, donors supporting us, and crowdfunding. Uh, but there is it's it's not like uh, there is like very low chance we could get, for example, even the grants if we started just be, from the idea. So in the beginning, of course, it was a lot of uh, crowdfunding, uh, meaning crowdfunding from uh, friends, colleagues, family. Uh, whoever possible, uh, just acquaintances, etc. So we started from uh, from this uh, uh, the closer circle, let's say closer circle, which was nine people, nine co-founders, and then going out and out. And uh, first we had the house, uh, rundown house, let's say that we had to renovate, and then we could get the money for renovations. Um, yeah, um, uh, what I would uh, like to also share to you is. Uh, uh, the challenges are very important that probably that we we were facing, which could be also uh, generalized uh, and could be a kind of a, a things that uh, uh, people could take into consideration when they're speaking, where, when they are thinking to make to build a social enterprise, especially type of uh, the enterprise that we are um, uh, that we are doing here. Uh, the things that uh, that was helping us uh, was, uh, I think, uh, persistent that we wanted really to make it like. I personally, for example, worked for, for these um, issues in Georgia for eight years already, and I wanted to leave my organization, but also, and I, I call it like my organization, uh, but I wanted to leave it in the secure and safe uh, space, uh, on the safe ground. And in, in my opinion, that was um, the idea that, we, that I had, but I did not have the money, but I had an idea, but also I had this um, power, of, uh, power to, to make this idea happen. So this persistence that we could make it happen, I think helped us um, a lot. Uh, the networks also helped us a lot. Like, as I told, using everyone, like for starting from your family to, uh, to your acquaintances uh, who were believing in us and contributing in our idea. Uh, skills and education, I think, is very important in social entrepreneurship. I did not have any kind of experience in social entrepreneurship or business thinking, mindset thing, but because that we were taking uh, every possible way of um, getting education in social entrepreneurship really helped us. Uh, that's and how that's how we started before even uh, purchasing the house and land. Uh, that did not help uh, us was um, a legal framework really complicated in Georgia because we don't have social entrepreneurship law uh, and we had to struggle a lot and, and uh, like still now we are we are struggling uh, with that. Uh, as I told like business mindset, business thinking, no one to help us um, in our team. Uh, all of us were from the um, uh, NGO or uh, civic uh, background uh donors were limited and still quite limited for us uh because this is infrastructural project let's say the one that the for the house itself when you need money it's infrastructural which is kind of a risky thing for donors um uh, to take initiative or it's just like lack of the, the donors available here uh we got the effect of course uh, from the um covid 19 because uh uh secondary third uh, uh, target, as I told, could be, for example, tourists. So most of the services that we could provide, we were not able to provide this summer. Um, uh, and we worked only for the educational activities. Uh, and uh, very challenging was, of course, uh, not having any experience in social entrepreneurship. Uh, what we learned during this time was that um, I think uh, a lot of things had done in on voluntary basis like and it's a it's a project of lifetime so it's like kind of a having a kid and you can never never leave it right so it's like a family member and uh you like wherever you go or i go uh, i know that there is this uh this house for for which i have to do um the things i have to volunteer for that but also uh, very important, not only myself, but I think it's important to have a sense of ownership, meaning the people for whom we built around, we tell them that it's a, it's a, it's a house that you are, where, where you are not only served, you are host and um, guest at the same time. So you serve yourself. 
Uh, so it's very value-based house, let's say. Otherwise, we cannot afford to provide this kind of uh, space where everything is uh, sparkling and everything organized for them. Um, uh, I think business people would help us a lot if we had kind of, you know, uh, uh, contacts uh, and support. We could also, for example, um, we could kind of take a loan and this kind of thing, but we didn't have uh, this experience, so we didn't, didn't want also, we didn't want to risk for that. Uh, I would take more time, for example, in figuring out legal structure, but because it, uh, what we were doing in Georgia is still considered to be kind of an uh, innovation, I think we could not find even the proper lawyers who would propose us the best um, uh, best example or best practices how we could set up the social and our social enterprise. So um, I would make it much more better, uh, but I still don't don't have an answer how I could do that. Uh, uh, I would say that the business plan and um, uh, crowdfunding campaign is very important. But as I said before, I think uh, like personal contacts uh, matter a lot, especially in the beginning. Uh, so you might have a business plan, but also a perfect business plan and or the crowdfunding uh, campaign. But um, uh, if you don't have also very clear social uh, mission, uh, this is complicated, but also like if you don't have this kind of a contact who would believe in you and trust in you also kind of difficult. So it's not only a person when I'm talking to you, but or probably the team also who uh, who are around you, because this cannot be done uh, kind of just around the sing single person. Uh, team is very important uh, in terms of stability. Uh, taking my example, jumping in and out of the project, being like very active and then going out, I think this is kind of uh, making a lot of effect. It's stalling the process a lot if you don't have um, the team members always, uh, the same team members always uh, always uh, involved in it. So if you, if you stick, you will make a faster progress, I think so. Um, it's very important also to secure the funds so that the team is functioning. So you have like, you know, kind of a salary so that they can think about, you know, uh, uh, how to um, uh, sustain the house uh, if they have the uh, money for that. Uh, and in the beginning, what I didn't think at all uh, and what turned out in the end is that I was thinking in the beginning to build a house for the NGO Iris group, but in the end, it turned out that I built another organization structure actually. So I had to set up kind of a terms of reference process, uh, like uh, rules of procedures for the uh, social enterprise and all these kind of things. And as I told you in the beginning, like uh, all the new team, like accountants, director, manager, etc., which is completely different structure and how to communicate this, communicate this social enterprise and the NGO, the Iris Group and Neighborhood, then I had to make this kind of um, uh, very uh, bold line uh, between themselves and also kind of stick to each other because of course we wanted it to be, uh, and we based this house because we wanted them um, to strengthen the Iris Group activities. But uh, yeah, it turned out that uh, we created a completely uh, new structure as well. Um, yeah, that is uh, what I wanted uh, to share. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I will be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margot, for this in-depth look of, of your initiative. Um, definitely a few questions will be coming your way in terms of, of further understanding. But before, I'd love to hear from other examples um, from Lebanon and, and uh, from Ziad. Please, Ziad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nelly. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, by giving by talking about two examples of social businesses that are the one I'm directly involved with and one that I'm very familiar with, both here in Lebanon. I'll just describe them uh, and then we can go more in depth in either one of them or answer any question later on. One of them is relatively recent and still quite small, about uh, started about three years ago. And the other one is uh, much older. It's about 20 years old now and uh, kind of an established business by now. <clears throat> so I'll start with the first one, uh, which is called Jellyfish. And I'll show you some pictures a little later on to bring it a little bit more to life, each one of these two initiatives. But Jellyfish, for example, is, is, is a small project that I started with a friend of mine, almost on a voluntary basis, with uh, some Syrian women refugees in Lebanon. You know that Lebanon right now hosts about a million plus Syrian refugees. Many of them are in uh, 
dire uh, situations, just like the rest of the country. So regardless of the circumstances that, that brought this about, this friend of mine and myself worked with these women to establish this social business for them. So that with, the, with the ultimate intention of, improve, of, of, of giving them some incremental uh, income. And we're talking here about, I mean, I know you guys have been talking about gender empowerment. You've been talking about radical, radicalization, uh, inequalities, inclusiveness. So this speaks directly to that. And that's why I chose this example. What we these women were, were were and continue to live in in refugee camps, very basic uh, housing, very well poor conditions, but now certainly much better than when we met them three years ago. But the first business relies on we we basically taught these women to collect uh, used plastic bags, not only from their region but from all from from a much larger geographic region than the one they're in. Plastic bags that would have otherwise gone to gar to the garbage. And in Lebanon, because we have no recycling and any of that, they basically would have gone to, to dumps, to garbage dumps that ended up in the sea or whatever and taken years to, 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 degen to degenerate. And my friend who I, I was handling the business side of things and my friend was handling the sort of the more creative uh, technical part of it. She taught them how to take these plastic bags, clean them, sort them, and then shred them into strings and eventually weave them just like they would weave a wool into different kinds of products. They started out with very small products, but then they eventually expanded to big beach bags, to even carpets, accessory items, Christmas ornaments, and so on. And so, based, and, and then we also took them to market. We exposed them to one of the trendiest organic markets in Lebanon where they started uh, exhibiting their products and people started loving the idea because first it was about empowering these women who when we met them were extremely shy and unable to sort of like see themselves as running any business whatsoever. And, and has, they've gone all the way to becoming sort of standing in the market and talking to people. It has also helped change the perception of the Lebanese who go to this market towards refugees and women refugees and what they can do. And people love the products because the products themselves are very nice, but also because they are contributing to saving the environment because all of these plastic bags would have otherwise gone to the, gone to, to trash to dumps basically so it was a win-win for everybody these women were able to train themselves gradually expand their business now they've been featured on many tv shows they're on they were on bbc they were on cnn cnbc all the major uh, arab uh, satellite networks i mean it's like a success story that everybody wants to sort of uh, partake in and now other ngos have come and they've given them some funding to expand the network and train other women so what started out as a very small project that my friend and I were sort of initiating almost in our spare time has now become a sort of a small business. And these guys are exporting their products all the way to the US. They have a Facebook page, they have Instagram accounts. So it started sort of a small thing and it grew. I'd like to share some pictures just to bring it, uh, sh show you some, um, you know, make this a bit more real for you. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen, but this is the, the lady who now sort of manages the whole thing. You can see some of the products behind her. These are all made from hundred from, from plastic bags uh, that would have actually gone to the, uh, you know, be thrown away. They, they, they shred them, they break them, they weave them. Uh, here are the women actually weaving, you know, that's, it's, it's basically, it's as simple as that. And they work from their homes, which culturally, for some of you understand the culture is important for these women. They have to take care of their families, their refugees, and so on. So it helps them create these things from home. And then this other woman picks them up and takes them to the, to the organic market to sell them. This is them, again, uh, creating the stuff. This is a sample of the stuff. This is all made from, from plastic bags. And they've come a long way in terms of the design. We actually, I'll talk about that later. And if I don't, please remind me. But I want to talk about the, the importance of the quality of the product and the quality of the design in making these successful. It is a key thing in, in, in the reason these guys were successful. This is another, another example. Uh, this is uh, one of the clients with a huge beach bag. I was talking earlier, this literally took thousands of, uh, of plastic bags to make, so save basically. And, and then here's their Facebook page. You can see a whole bunch of products here that they sell on their, on their Facebook page. Uh, some more stuff. This rug here that you can see is, uh, you know, some people are, are commissioning custom-made drugs for their homes, for their living rooms, whatever, made all from, from these plastic bags and flower pots and so on. So this is the first example I want to talk about, a very, you know, sort of dear to my heart because, you know, I kind of randomly helped uh, start this thing. And uh, it's really amazing to see the success and the impact it has had on the lives of these women, 
on giving them some extra money income on the environment, but also on the perception of whoever comes in contact with these people with the refugees, because there's this, this tension between Lebanese and host communities and refugees and so on. So this helps a little bit sort of improve the, the, the image, uh, so to speak. The other example I want to, I want to talk about is much older. It's a 20 year old business founded by a lady called named Sarah Baidun, and the business is called Sarah's Bag. Sarah Baidun in 2000 was a sociology student at the American University of Beirut, and through her studies was exposed uh, to uh, prison, women, uh, women's prison. She visited the women in, in a prison and saw the dismal conditions we're talking about here in 2000, not that it's much better right now, but, but she, was, she saw the dismal state of these women and the fact that they had zero income uh, no ability to buy anything in prison, like really, really bad situation. She, she, and she, 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 she associated emotionally being a sociology student and she des decided to create this business called Sarah's Bag. She had to go through a lot of red tape to uh, allow the authorities uh, uh, for her to work with the inmates, with the, with the women inmates while they were in jail. She taught them how to, again, create world-class designer bags and clutches that were extremely sort of on the fashion, uh, you know, front end, and then sell them not only in Lebanon, but these things are sold in, in New York, in London, in Dubai. Now it's become a worldwide business. Queen Rania wears these clutches, Amal, whatever, Amal Clooney has worn these clutches. They've been showed on, in Vogue. I mean, this has now become quite a business, but it really relies on these women inmates creating the stuff. And then some of them, when they leave the prison, because you understand the stigma associated with women who have left prison, nobody wants to employ them. There's sort of a stigma around them. They continue to work in their villages with Sarah Baidun, and they're encouraged to create local networks of women to help in this business as well. So this also gives them a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a network. It really empowers these women. But then this is a much larger scale than what I was talking about before. Like I said, this is now a global product featured in in, again, I'll show you some pictures here to uh, bring it a little bit more to life as well. I hope you can see, oh, this is now we're back to the ladies. Uh, okay, this is, do you see this, Sarah's bag? So these are some of the products that, that these women uh, inmates have created. And now some of them are out and they continue to work with, uh, with Sarah. These are, I mean, this is like high fashion. This is not sort of like a small, uh, sort of folklore, what do you call it, like handicraft thing in some little local market that people buy out of charity. These are like considered really high-end fashion items that people pay hundreds of dollars for. So this is now a very full-on legitimate business, but, but very much serving a very specific social purpose, which is the women, empowering these women who have been, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're, they need the support they can get. More uh, from the, more products from the from the website of Sarah's bag. Uh, again, this is uh, here. Here we see all the fashion magazines, the international fashion magazines that are featured uh, items from Sarah's bag. The, again, all of these you know international fashion magazines. This is Sarah Baidun herself, the founder. This is Amal Clooney wearing the thing, and on top of that, Queen Rania. So this is to say that this has now become a a, a full-on business. Twenty years later, it's a very successful business. It, it uh, benefits right now approximately 200 women. That's the network that, that's benefiting from this business, whether they're, most of them are incarcerated, but a lot of them have also left jail and are now working in their villages, again, uh, creating these, uh, these. So there's a lot of lessons learned from both of these, but I'll stop now and I'm, I'm, I'm sure they'll come up later in more discussion and uh, you know, in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Ziad. Um, such inspiring stories as well coming from Lebanon. Thank you very much for sharing them. Um, I'll allow myself a couple of questions for, for the both of you about really the, the, the practice on the ground. Um, so my first question is what type of, of legal challenges that seems to be something um, that you, you touched upon, Margot, but you seem to nod as well, Ziad, on the type of legal challenges that you have encountered or witnessed in, in other social enterprises in when you come to set up your actual social enterprise and what would be your recommendations for uh, policy changes around improving this type of legal framework around setting up a social enterprise? So I'd love to start with this one very practical question at the end of the day. 
I think Margot touched on this in her presentation, and we also have the exact same issue. I mean, again, here in Lebanon as well, we don't have a, a law for social businesses. So, they, so most people are forced to revert to either setting up an NGO, which I'm not a fan of, or they set up a, a regular business, but then they call it a social business, but then they have to face all the challenges that a regular business faces in terms of taxes and tax and all these kinds of, you know, and then the fees they have to pay to the government for, for the license and all that kind of stuff. So the environment is actually very challenging. It's not at all pro-social businesses. In the case of Sarah's, Sarah's Bag, which like I said, is now a 20 year old business. She has a regular business. It's set up as a regular business, any small business that, you know, nothing social enterprise from a legal perspective about it. For the Syrian ladies, the Jellyfish Initiative, like many other social initiatives that happen, it is still in the informal sector. People cannot even afford to begin thinking about setting it up uh, uh, as, a, as, a form, as a regular business because they just can't afford the, the setup fees. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, there's a lot of people who are working on creating the, the proper laws for setting up a social business. But again, in a country such as ours, where there are so many things to deal, about, uh, to deal with, I mean, this is just yet one other thing. But definitely, absolutely, there is a need for uh, in, an encouraging legal uh, setup that would encourage more people to get into this and not tax them. Because again, one of the main issues here is that, uh, and we, we maybe we'll talk about that more later, uh, at the end of the day, a social business has to be profitable, but it will never, be, if it's true to its cause and if it's true to its mission, it's never going to be this multi-million dollar making business. I mean, ultimately, of course not. I mean, it's going to be sustainable. Uh, at best, it's going to be able to provide for its employees, salaries and a decent living and all that. But it's never going to be this mega business or even like a small size, uh, fully profitable business that's going to be afford, that's going to be able to afford uh, taxation and all the heavy uh, expenditures associated with regular businesses definitely an issue of concern for sure mm. of course and 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 margo i mean you mentioned at some point mm. how the social enterprise belongs to the ngo is that also because if you create a business i'd imagine you cannot receive grants anymore which you would need as a seed funding so tell us a little bit more about that those legal challenges on your side um, yeah, um, just uh, to, uh, to answer from Georgian perspective or the legal framework, how it works here, um, uh, which is pretty complicated, but still uh, what is the uh, issue with the social enterprises is that you have two choice, basically, you have to register as an NGO or you have to register as an LTD. Uh, and then it's exactly like uh, if I will register as an NGO, uh, I have already an NGO Iris group uh, and I don't want to give the same, uh, you know, news, create a new double structure uh, for the uh, social enterprise, right? Because I actually the things that has to be done, it's done because of it, it is created because of uh, the house exists because of Iris group. And the other, other hand, you can be uh, LTD, but the then donors are looking at you very suspicious, like you are a business. So how can we make sure that your business is social? Uh, so that was um, very hard and it is very hard because in the end we took a decision that uh, it became an LTD because we wanted the flexibility and we didn't really want to create a struct, like because it, it's potentially, it's really um, a, can make, uh, uh, we can make as a business that is why we did not want to limit ourselves. And also, as I told, I, we did not want to create a second structure. That is why we registered an LTD. But the house itself doesn't belong to LTD or NGO because we, we didn't take a final decision to whom to give it. We were expecting, for example, the bigger uh, donor or someone to tell us like, OK, we give you the money and it has to be uh, to the, uh, to, uh, it has to be the uh, part of the NGO or it has to be part of the LTD and uh, we can give you money in this case. So with both options we left. So now it's uh, uh, the house itself is on the um, property uh, on the name of each of uh, one of our co-founder, not all of us, but one co-founder. And uh, the LTD uh, itself uh, on the paper exists as, as uh, uh, um, co-founders of the group of the people who uh, actually collected the money to buy the house. So uh, yeah, we, we are waiting. Either it, it can become an NGO, either it can become an LTD, or if the social entrepre entrepreneurship law uh, will be uh, finally passes in, uh, in the parliament, uh, because there is a draft law, but it doesn't exist yet, and we are uh, expecting it to be in um, 
like next to yes uh, or something it should be already there so that is why uh kind of yeah that's that's kind of a pending thing but it does not really limit us to do uh activities meaning that ltd can for example make uh money even though it's for example it could be renting the space from uh, one of the co-founder yeah so yeah i know that it's difficult but it's uh it's doable and you know uh, kind of becoming flexible, also asking to lots of lawyers how it should work. But even if you try to make it like very, uh, like to uh, follow all the rules that the co country is proposing to you, then sometimes it's for the donor not acceptable or for the business um, or the, for the banks could be not acceptable. So uh, you have to all the time uh, be flexible and uh, do this kind of uh, liaison uh, with different uh, uh, institutions or uh, yeah, yeah different institutions i would say and and that definitely has a cost to the kind of legal homework that you have to do but okay thank you so much for for this insight uh, my other question was on the skill building so at least for our audience today mostly it's people coming from the field of civil society academic etc not necessarily the field coming from uh, business. So Ziad, you briefly mentioned at some point about the importance of the quality. And so my question is the following, what business skills, um, in your opinion, to the both of you, do you recommend that social entrepreneurship, uh, social entrepreneurs or aspiring social entrepreneurs coming from civil society, the NGO world, et cetera, should seek to gain first in order to really launch into this Businessy, let's say, side of their work. Uh, am I starting? Can yes. I start? Yeah. Um, lots of skills. Uh, so let's uh, and there, and and it's two sides of there's two sides of the story. So I remember once, and this is not necessarily directly social businesses, but at some point, I was contracted by UNESCO to uh, to run a a program, a small program that was targeting uh, artists and 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 craftsmen and craftswomen, artisans, uh, to help them create sustainable businesses. Okay, it wasn't the, the business itself was not supposed to be a social business, but mm -hmm. it, the idea was that to help these people gain some business acumen to help them create social businesses. Now, the people who happened to join the workshop, artists. Uh, creative people of the sort, and they're associated with UNESCO and so on, happen to be of the mindset that they've been always used to receiving grants for them to create pieces of art and artistic projects and installations and so on. So they even came to the workshop without having fully understood why they were there initially, with the expectation that they're going to receive a grant and they're going to say, hey, go and create an art piece or create an artwork. And then when they figured out that we're actually there to help them create a business around their art or their talent or their skill, whatever that is. It was incredible the amount of resistance at the beginning. And not, not, not in a bad way, but they're like, oh, but we don't know. We're not business people. We, we're like artists. We, uh, you know, we you give us money and we create something. So there's this already this, uh, this, this hurdle that people think, you know, like if they're an art, if, even if, you know, let forget being an artist, if they want, want to do social good, that being a business, uh, having business skills is a bad thing or it's something that they can't do. So it's already sort of a challenge to explain this concept of social businesses that sort of merges the two, you know, the, the, the doing good and the gaining financially mm -hmm. and sort of saying, you know, it's okay, you can do both things and you won't be the devil if you suddenly start making money while serving a good social cause. So there's that already, that's that thing to overcome. The other thing which we faced with the, the Syrian ladies and I'm sure Sarah Baidun faced it with her, uh, with her collaborator, collaborator women when she started with them, is pushing uh, people to move from the, uh, what's the word? I've been looking for the word and I can't find it, but when you do something that's more like crafty and little sort of like homemade and you sell it in the local bazaar and people say, oh, it's cute and they buy it because they want to encourage you. And it's sort of like on that small scale of things pushing people to up their game, up their product, where it becomes a product that's desirable in and of itself without the, the wanting to help you 
as a social entrepreneur. And that's where the key is for me for successful social businesses. It's to get these businesses to operate in a fully entrepreneurial mindset where they want to compete fully just like they had, as if they had a regular business that did not have any social, social benefit. So they have to really up their design skills. They have to read their, their market, understand what the market views as desirable and then cater to that market. And I saw that firsthand with Jellyfish. I mean, I don't really have the, I mean, kind of, I have the sort of a basic understanding of, but you know, they're working with bags and clutches and, and, and accessories and stuff. So my friend who was collaborating with me on this, she had to make a huge effort frankly, to upscale the, even the taste of these women, to be very frank about it, so that the, the taste, instead of them creating nice, cute flowers and stuff that they would put up, you know, they started out with creating plastic flowers out of these bags that were very tacky, to be perfectly honest, and that no one would have ever bought them except out of feeling pity or feeling sort of like, I want to help these women. But that would have never taken you anywhere. They would have just lasted for a week or two or a month, and then they would have gone home. The challenge was to get them to, you know, to expose them to what, what the, the, the target audience wants, what is quality design, what is the, and, and then up their skills. And then now they're able to see the difference between where they started and where they are. But that takes a lot of effort. And that's the kind of skill that is mostly needed with social entrepreneurs is to get them into this mindset that we are not, that people are not going to buy our service or our product as uh, as an act of good, uh, like a, a, a charity thing. They have to buy the service or buy the product because people want it for itself. Oh, and it makes them happier that it's also serving a social cause, but that should not be the selling point. That's sort of an, ex that's the mindset that you have to impart to most social entrepreneurs. So really move beyond this kind of charity mechanism and, and, yes, and, and really the, have and a feel desirable good, yeah. Compete, they really have to compete as an entrepreneur the, and they have the, to push themselves. And the market like reality. The real product, yes. Thank you, Ziad. Um, how, how about you, uh, Margot? What type of business skills do you feel were missing to you and your team? Mm, uh, I think uh, one of the important things is uh, how to develop a product or even create a product that is, yeah, the, the, basically what uh, Ziad was also mentioning, but uh, at the same time, and also like kind of uh, marketing of the product. That is very uh, that should be very important for the business perspective. But one of the one of the uh, things also what I want to add uh, and underline, I think, uh, in the case of so what is different for social enterprise and very difficult, uh, tricky thing is that to uh, you you have the constant uh, challenge of client beneficiary uh, uh, type of uh, thing. You know, are you okay? You can make a product which is which could be sold, well sold, but does it fit to your values? Do you have to, um, how do you want to adapt to the reality? For example, uh, if uh, this summer I would uh, be able to host uh, tourists instead of hosting educational activities in my space and make much more money, would I be, um, would I do that? Like uh, uh, instead of serving my uh, social uh, mission, uh, serving for this type of uh, 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 clients, let's say. So this is kind of uh, really, really um, very uh, challenging part, I would say. And uh, yeah, it's it's about the values. Like I think the uh, social enterprises are um, the things that are that, that is the, the value based uh, um, entities. And then uh, yeah, you make uh, kind of these kind of decisions. And sometimes. Uh, uh, business would be uh, directing you to, from to a different direction but you have also to kind of find your way and uh, swim in the way that you are not losing a lot in this yeah so as you grow and seek financial sustainability and growth try to still keep in mind your your values and why you're here um these are great yeah. advice i can Thank comment you. quickly on that if you would allow me yeah. sorry just a quick on what on what margot was <laughs> saying when we started out, I mean, because I also do a lot of coaching for social, for new social businesses, and I do a lot of training on that. So when we started with this, I would say even 10 years ago, maybe even more, we were very, so you know how it's like a new thing and we were very, uh, you know, clear cut about it and that you, you, whenever you were faced with a decision, you absolutely have to favor 
the social benefit over the financial benefit. And we were very sort of like, you know, harsh about this thing. But now with time and with the challenges and everything that's going on around us, I think that we've mellowed out a little bit on, on being so rigid in our differentiation. And, you know, I kind of say now, you know what, it's okay sometimes because we live in such tough economic times and whatever, and, you know, just everything is against social, against business in general, that as long as overall your social mission is not compromised and you're always on that trend that at the in, in a macro level the social cause that is is served it's okay if sometimes you end up you know sort of making a bit more money from without you know as long as you're not doing any harm and as long as that never becomes your primary motive as long as you know your your, your conscience is clear that your social mission and your social cause are, conti are continue to be served you're going to have to make some 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 compromises at some point i mean i guess with age you mellow we used to be much more harsh about this before <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ziad, for, you know, this non-guilt trip. It's important in our work, non-guilt trip, especially in difficult times. And you in Lebanon, yeah. you know what difficult time means these days, right? <laughs> Thank you very much for this. Um, we are going to close our streaming now. I would like to thank very much our INC uh, colleagues for having followed the, the streaming in the last three days. This is our last panel of this workshop together. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the wider audience uh, who came across our, our discussion. And uh, we hope to see you for more workshops.